A position vector, oh, there's a new seating plan, you're right behind Xavier. Okay. A position vector says if we consider the origin as a starting point and we have some point in two-dimensional space P, then O to P would be P's position vector. Because it's fixed, it's no longer floating around in a free vector. It's fixed to the origin. Suppose we have two points M and N, and little m and little n represent the vectors that are the position vectors for points M and N. How do we get from N to N? So what we want is we want to start here, and end here. And much like the comic that we saw at the beginning of class, it doesn't matter which way you go, as long as you start at one point and end at the other point. And so if I need to use just M and N, if those are the only pathways I'm allowed to use, can you see that I could get from M to N if I started at M and went back to O, and then went from O and then went to N? Now we would show that by saying going from M to N is the same as going back to O, so that would be minus M because it's going in the opposite direction, and then adding N. In part B, they say, how could you go from N to M? So again, I'll redraw it out here. We've got N down here, M up here, the origin here. These vectors were M and N. Now if we wanted to start here and end at M, we could do that by first going back to the origin. That would be minus n, and then going from the origin to n. So in vectors, we're not necessarily concerned about the direction, but we're concerned about where we start and where we end, not how far t or how long it takes to get there. So now we're going to add a point p in between M and N. And you have to get from O to P. This is where we want to start, and this is where we want to end, but you're only allowed to travel along pathways that work in the directions of M's and N's. Well, could you see that I could start here, use purple, and if I went along to N and then I went to P, that would get me there from O to P? So how do we write that out? Well, we would say that O to P, what did I do? I went to N, so that's going in N's direction. And then since P is the midpoint, of N to M, does it make sense that I went halfway from N to M? That's just describing the one pathway I chose. Now we haven't completely finished the question yet because we haven't stated everything in terms of M's and N's. But N to M we figured out before N to M was minus N plus M. I can distribute this half Oops, wrong sign there. 
minus and a plus here. And then n minus half an n says that I'll go halfway the direction to n plus halfway the direction to m. Now let's see if this actually makes sense. I'm going to go back to the picture we had before. Erase everything. To the best of my abilities, I'm going to put point P there. To the best of my abilities here, I'm going to mark the midpoint. Does that look about halfway between M and N? And according to this, if I take half of N, which is that bottom arrow, and then add half of M, which was that arrow, does it get me directly to P? Yes. And so what we've done is we've said, you're allowed to travel in only the directions of M and N. How would you get to P? Well, if I walked halfway in the direction of N and then turned and walked halfway in the direction of M, I would get to P. And that's what our simplification did. Okay, we'll do one more together, and I'll give you one to try, and then we'll do, I'll give you two to try. So the points A, B, and C have position vectors A, B, and C. P is the midpoint of A, B, and Q is the midpoint of B, C. How do we get the position vectors of P and Q in terms of A, B, and C. Well, I can get from O to P by going along A and then halfway from A to B. Can you picture it? Going from O to P, you could get there by going along route A and halfway from A to B. Now, A to B, how do I get from A to B? Well, I could get from A to B. A to B would be going negative A back to the origin and then plus B. And a little bit of simplification here, distributing that half, combining your like terms, half of A plus half of B. Similarly, we could get OQ in a similar way. We could go from B plus half of BC, and BC is negative B plus C. So you get there by 1 half B plus 1 half C. So now in part B, we want to get from P to Q. Starting at P, wow, that was bad. Try that again. Starting at P, going to Q, and we're only allowed to travel in the directions of A's and B's. How would we do that? A's, B's, and C's, sorry. Well, since we figured out OP already, we know this value. And since we figured out OQ, we know this value. Now, since we know already the position vectors P and Q in terms of A, B, and C, we could say, well, we could go from P to Q by first going back to O and then going 
from O to Q. And since we already figured out O to P, P to O is just negative O to P. Plus O to Q. Whoa. Oh my goodness. Switch colors. And O to P was 1 half A plus 1 half B. And O to Q was 1 half B plus 1 half C. Distribute that negative, and we get negative 1 half A. The negative 1 half B and the 1 half B will cancel out plus 1 half C. So what does this mean? If we go back to our diagram, if I want to get from P to Q, I can draw on my diagram in purple half of A, and I can draw in purple half of C. And apparently, if I go from P to Q by doing 1 half P and then the negative 1 half A, which means this would have the arrow on the other direction, sure enough, it matches up perfectly. It gets me from P to Q, only allowing myself to travel in the directions of A, B, and C. Pretty cool. Here is one for you to try. All right, so in A, we want to get from O to B. And one way you could get there is going from O to A and then A to B. So that would just be vector A plus vector B. Now if we wanted to get from B to D, starting at B, ending at D, you could get there by going negative O to B, so that would be here, and then from O to D. Can you see that O to D is exactly the same as O to A, just in the opposite direction? So we can get there from O to B, negative O to B, which we already figured out in A, plus a negative A would get us there as well. Simplifying that, we get negative 2As plus B. Now, if I drew out negative 2As, starting at B, that would be negative 1A. Here would be another negative B A, and here's negative B. Can you see that that would get us there as well? So when we're adding and subtracting vectors from a starting point, the vectors aren't fixed. They can sort of be whichever way you want them. We could have done this in this order. We could have had negative A, then negative B, then negative A. That would still get us to the same spot. And finally, in part C, if you want to go from C to F, You might be able to just look at the diagram and say, that's negative 2b's. Or you could take a long part around. If you like the pathways that are given, you could say, oh, I could go here, right, then here, then here. This one is the same as a. This one's the same as negative B, and this one is negative A plus B.
Now, in this question, we are given some proportions. So one of the proportions, it says that AB to BP is 2 to 1. So that means if this length is 2, this length is 1. It's double whatever that length is. So since I don't know the le lengths, I could call this 1x and that 2x, and that would be true. Another ratio is CQ to QB is 1 to 3. So if this is 1, this is 3, or any multiple of that. Since we don't know exactly how long it is, I could call that one length Y. The other one will be three times as long. But it's not bad just to think in numbers. You could say this one's one, this one's two, while you're thinking about that one. This one's one, this one's three, while you're thinking of that one. Now we want to express each of these vectors in terms of A and B. So the starting point isn't so bad, A to B. I could get from A to B by first going back to O and then along B. So that would be negative A plus B. If I wanted to get from A to P, it's a little bit harder to see how to use the pathways that we have so far. But if we use our ratios and say, I know A to B already. Does it make sense that A to P is 1.5 times A to B? Because if this ratio is 2 to 1, going from A to P would be one and a half times going from A to B. In my work here, I had the one and a half as a fraction, three over two, and then using the values that I already knew from A to B, we get negative three halves A plus three halves B. Similarly, O to P, now if you wanted to get from O, to P, as a new position vector, we could go over to A, because we know that one, and now we figured out A to P, so we could take A plus A to P, simplify it, and we get negative one-half A plus three-halves B. And then finally in part four, and I'll scroll back down again, if you're not quite done copying or writing it on. In part o four, we want to go from O to Q. Well, I could get from O to Q by first going from O to B and then going from B back to Q. And so what I've written down, though, is O to B plus B to Q. Well, O to B was easy. That's just B. B back to Q, can you see that B back to Q, since this is a parallelogram, would be parallel to A? But because there is a ratio of 1 to 3 here, does it make sense 
that going from B to Q is three quarters of the way from B to C. Because if you counted up all the units, that total length of that would be four, and you've gone three out of the four units, or that fraction of the way all the way back. And so when we write that out, we're going to B, and then we're going three quarters of the way backwards on A, so that would be negative three quarters A. In the next part, we want to find out what Q to P is. So again, it's going to be really helpful that we've figured out the position vectors O to Q, and we figured out the position vector O to P. If I want to find out how to get from Q to P, I can just go negative OQ plus OP. And since I've already figured out O to Q, and I've figured out O to P, this will be relatively straightforward. So Q to P will be negative OQ plus OP. I can write out what OQ is from before, and I can write out what OP is from before. And I get that you can go from Q to P by going 1 quarter A plus 1 half B. The favorite thing that I like to do at the end of these is go back to our question and actually estimate one quarter of A and half of B and test how good our answer is. If I go a quarter A starting at Q and then I add a half B, Is it pretty close to ending right at point P? Yes. Position vectors of the points A, B, and C. So sometimes I really like writing these as column vectors. There's A. There's B. And there's C. Those are position vectors of three points in three dimensional space. And this is hard for you to visualize because I don't have a three dimensional space in front of me. I'd like to have like a holographic display here where I can move points around, but they haven't bought that for me yet. Now we want to say, are these points in a line? Whew. So what we're trying to say is, are the points A, B, and C, and here's, if here's the origin, this is my position vector for A, my position vector for B, and my position vector for C. And we want to know, given those position vectors, can we tell if A, B, and C are in a straight line? Well, we have to start thinking about what does it mean to go in a straight line, as opposed to not going in a straight line, to see if we can problem solve a strategy to help us figure this out. In two dimensions, that's a straight line. Oh, that's not a straight line. What can you tell me about A to B and B to C in the straight line compared to A to B and B to C in the not straight line?
A to B would have the same direction as B to C. If we were talking in two dimensions, we would say they have the same slopes. If we want to talk about two dimensions and three dimensions, we would say they have to be parallel. Does that make sense? That if it's going to be a straight line, straight lines, the two little line segments are parallel in the same direction. They don't have to be the same length. But when they're not in a straight line, they're not parallel. So how do we tell that they're going in the same direction? So we can write this out. Let's write it out as if we can show AB If we can show AB and BC are parallel, if they're going in the same direction, then we'll know they're a straight line. Well, how do we go from A to B? We go negative AO plus OB. We know O to A is 2, negative 1, 1. We know O to B, 3, 2, negative 1. So we can say that A to B is going to be 1, 3, negative 2. And B to C, will be negative b plus c, and c was 6, 11, negative 7. Which will give me 3, 9, negative 6. Now, how do we tell if vectors are parallel or not? Two vectors are parallel if they have the same direction, and one is just a scalar multiple of the other one. So if I take b to c, b to c was 3, 9, negative 6. If it's equal to a to b with some sort of multiplication, if I can multiply a to B to get B to C, they'll be parallel. Can you see a value of K that would work? Yeah, sometimes the mental math is so easy you can just say, hey, K equals 3. And it would have to equal 3 and work for each component for them to be parallel. If the first component and the second component work but the third one didn't, they will not be parallel. But when K is equal to 3, those two are equal. So we can say, since BC equals three ABs, we know that BC and AB are parallel. Therefore, A, B, and C are collinear.
that is the first way that you could show that they are in a straight line. Another way, if we go back, we go back to our little diagram here, and we think about A to C. In the one where they're in a straight line, can you see that A to C is the same distance as A to B and B to C? But in the one where they're not in a straight line, can you see that A to C is shorter than going from A to B plus B to C? So another method for proving this is you could find the length of AB and we know how to do that with magnitudes of vectors. You could find the length of B to C. You could find the length of A to C. And if you add up B, A to B and B to C and they're equal to A to C, then you would know that way as well that they are collinear. That method has just a few more calculations, so the parallel method is a little bit shorter, but both would be considered fine. Simplifying vectors. If you went from A to B, then B to C, then D to E, and then finally C to D, where would you end up? Well, again, let's draw a little picture here. Here's A, B, C, D, E. We need to go from A to B, then add B to C, then add E to D to E, and then add C to D, where do we end up? A to E. So there's a diagram showing it in exactly the same order. Now, would it have mattered if I changed the order at all? Okay? Let's take, well, let's do A to B and then B to C first. But let's take these ones. Instead of doing D to E first, let's do C to D and then D to E. Would we still end in the same place? Yes. So when adding our vectors, it doesn't matter the order that you add them. You will get the same result. And if the middle numbers are the same, does it make sense that I could go, well, A to B and then B to C, that's just the same as A to C. And A to C plus C to D, that would be the same as going from A, whoa, to D. And A to D plus D to E would be the same as going from A to E. So in the second one, now we've got a whole bunch of multiples. The first thing I want you to look at is some of them are opposites. You've got A to B's and B to A's. You've got A to C's, no. We've got C to D's and D to C's. That's like going forwards and backwards. If I take four steps forward and then take two steps backwards, that would be the same as just taking two steps forward to begin with. So if I underline this one and this one, and this one and this one, and this one, oh, no, that one doesn't match up. If I underline those ones, 
Can you see that the red ones could be put together? You'd be just left with two BAs. The green ones could be put together. Maybe left with four CDs. We still have four ACs and two DAs. Question? Now, next thing we're going to look at is can you see that here we got four CDs plus four ACs? That's the same as four ACs plus four CDs. I'm going to rewrite that one. I'm going to take out the four, factor out the four out of both of those, and write AC plus CD in the other direction. If you have AC plus CD, does it make sense that you will go from A to D? So if I simplify that, I still have two BAs. And now I have plus four ADs. So again, while I'm simplifying, what I'm doing is I'm looking for where are there places that I can add my vectors easily together, where the letters match up? At first, I looked where are there vectors that are exactly the same, just opposite directions. And then after that, I said, could I add some of these together? Here, can you see that those are the same, just in opposite directions? If I added those together, I'm going to get two ADs. If I factor out my two, can I put together BA and AD? Yes. And we've been able to simplify this one and simplify the vectors all the way down. Our last example, we have a rectangle O, A, oh, I'm going to draw it a little bit better to scale. O, A, B, C is our rectangle. We're told that the length of O, A is 8. The length of A, B is 6. This is vector A. This O, C is vector B. Express the two diagonals in terms of A and B. Well, one diagonal would be from O to B. The other diagonal could be, you could write A to C or C to A. Can you see that I could go from O to B by first going along A, and AB is equal to OC, so it'll just be A plus B. And going from A to C, that would be negative A plus B. Part B says find the length of OB. So remember this notation, the magnitude is the same as the length. Find the length of O to B. Well, O to B makes a right angle triangle. 
you could use your regular math and do a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Maybe you could see that right away and do 36 plus 64 and get 10. Maybe you want to give your vectors coordinates. Okay? If this is my origin, does it make sense that point A would be at the point 0, 8 and point C would be at the point 0, 6? If we called those vectors, we could write them as column vectors. C is not written right here. We go 6, 0. If we wrote them as column vectors, well, we know that OB is A plus B. And if we wrote our, out our column vectors for this, this would be 0, 8 plus 6, 0. In other words, we would get the point 6, 8. If you were thinking about coordinates, would it make sense that this point is at 6, 8 if we wrote it as a vector 6, 8? And if we used our magnitude formula to find the length of OB, it's the square root of each component, which would give you the square root of 100, which would give you 10 as well. So we could do a little bit extra work in this case, knowing the geometry is probably faster for us. But in some cases, if this was a three-dimensional question, working with the vectors would be easier. Part C says, find the length of OB plus CA. What would happen if we added both our diagonals together? Okay, On our diagram, can you see that OB is there, CA is here, so if I added it up there, it would go there. Can you see from the diagram that it's equal to 16? Because where do you start? You start here you end up here, which is like going up 8 twice. If we wanted to use our vectors, OB is A plus B. CA would be negative B plus A. So if I write that out inside of here, OB was A plus B. And C to A is negative B plus A, this simplifies just to be the lengths of two A's. Since we know the length of one A is 8, the length of two A's would be 16. And finally, they want us to add OA plus AC plus CO. Well, OA plus AC will start at O and end at C. And OC plus CO will start at O and at O. Uh oh. If you start at O and end at O, you haven't gone anywhere. This is why I don't like running around the block. Because I end at the same place I started, and it feels like, did I just waste time? I know it's supposed to be good for you, exercise, but it does feel like I just wasted time. I could have got back to the same spot a lot quicker if I hadn't have left. So O to O is written as, do you see, can you tell the difference? These ones are fat O's. This is a skinny zero. This is the zero vector. We didn't go anywhere. 
Okay, so there's homework there at the bottom. I'll give that sheet to you guys.